Good morning. It is Monday, the 10th of July, and I finally have a working microphone again. So I apologize that this is late, but better late than never. And uh, hopefully we won't have any problems the rest of the semester. So uh, today's video, uh, this first one is called Life in the Antebellum South. And really we're going to be looking at what the Civil War period looked like before the Civil War actually happens. So um, first of all, how does the South grow? When we talked about colonization, we really only talked about the coast, but by the 1800s, the country has actually grown quite a bit. Uh, you're going to get early people, like uh, independent farmers and herdsmen, uh, who are going to move into Alabama and Mississippi during the 1830s. By the 1840s, they're into Texas. And so people are continually moving further and further west, probably earlier than you really thought. And um, the reason that they're going towards the West is most of the land has already been taken by others. So people who need to own their own farms or need places for their animals to graze, they're going to have to move further and further West just because of the population growth. Uh, there's this myth that everybody in the South uh, was a cotton farmer or something like that, but in reality, they're not. Because if just think about Northern Georgia, Northern Alabama, Northern Mississippi, lots of wood or i should say lots of forests lots of trees and you just you can't have large-scale farming in those wooded areas so that's why a lot of these people who are moving are going to be these independent farmers technically they're called yeoman farmers 1793 is when the cotton gin is invented by Eli Whitney. Now, uh, Eli Whitney thought that he was doing everybody a favor by creating a labor-saving device, but what he actually does is he increases slavery. Uh, and that has to do with the type of cotton that was grown in the cotton areas of the South. Originally, there was something called long staple cotton. It's a cotton that has a very long growing season. It has fewer seeds and the threads, the feel of the cotton was much softer. That type of cotton could only be grown in a very small number of places. Like they have to be places with a really long growing season and lots of rain. So you're really gonna be just looking at places right along the coast. But when we get to the cotton gin coming into play, you don't have to wait as long for the cotton to be harvested. And that's because the cotton gin will spread out the cotton fibers and let the cotton seeds be removed a lot easier. So suddenly you can do the short staple cotton where you don't have to have as long of a growing season and it doesn't have to be as hot or as wet. And in some places where you were growing long staple cotton, you can now do two crops instead of just one. So cotton will spread throughout the Southeast, but also slavery spit is gonna spread throughout the Southeast as well. Now, why is this gonna happen? There's really three reasons. Number one, um, English cotton mills. England is gonna be the first place to go through a textile revolution and an industrial revolution. And somewhere between 80 to 90% of all the cotton grown in the South is going to go to England. Uh, the leftover is going to go to New England. So very, very little of the cotton is gonna stay in the South. Like I said, 80, 90% of it is gonna to go to England and then the rest of it goes to New England. Uh, the final thing though is tobacco is not worth as much as it used to be by the time we get into the early 1800s. And so these farmers <clears throat> are looking for new ways to make money and cotton is going to be that new way to make money. Now, as you can probably guess with cotton expanding, slavery is going to expand as well. Uh, in the 40 years before the Civil War happens, there are over 2 million African Americans who are going to be moved into these new cotton producing areas. All right, social relations in the white South. Um, there are really four different groups of people that you gotta worry about when it comes to Southern society in, in the, before the Civil War. Uh, planters, small slaveholders, yeomen or independent farmers, and then poor whites. Uh, planters are gonna be at the top of the food chain, so to speak, but they're actually the fewest number. 
what makes a, a planter? Uh, if you own 20 or more slaves, there's only about 5% of the population. Uh, I know when you watch movies, it seems like everybody is a large scale planter, but in reality, it's 5% of the population. Uh, you, it takes a lot of money to run a plantation. It takes a lot of money to buy and sell the slaves. And these planters are very often in debt. They're often moving around because they want to find ways to make more money. Because the planter is often away on business, it is actually the plantation mistress, the woman of the plantation, who does a lot of the business transactions. Uh, beyond that, small slaveholders are roughly 15 to 20 percent of the population. Uh, they're going to be people who own a one to 20 slaves, and they're almost like the swing voters. If they live amongst the planters, they're going to act more like a planter. If they live among the independent yeoman farmers, they're going to act more like the farmers. And the reason for that really is um, they want to fit in with those that they're around. So they have dreams, I guess I'll say, of becoming one of the planters, of breaking into that upper class. And so if they're living amongst them, they want to be well respected. They want to be able to blend in. Uh, if they're amongst the yeoman independent farmers, uh, they may have to rely on the farmers for some help, or maybe the farmers are going to do some business with them. So these small slaveholders are very much kind of in the middle. Sorry. Uh, okay, there's, there's where I am. Um, yeoman farmers, these are the independent farmers, they are about 60% of the population. They are by far the majority of the people. These are the people who are going to live in the northern Georgia mountains or the Tennessee area of the Appalachians. Uh, these yeoman farmers are going to be people who live in northern Alabama, northern Mississippi. Uh, they don't own any slaves. They may borrow or rent a slave at best. But by and large, they're going to do their own land. They're going to own their own farms. These farms are usually up to 200 acres or so. And um, they're really the backbone of the South. Uh, finally, you've got the poor whites, which is about 10% of the population. And in reality, the poor whites and the slaves have a very similar lifestyle, with the exception of the slaves don't have any freedom. And what I mean by that is they're going to live in a similar style house. They're going to have... You know, no money. They're going to um, be working for others. Uh, the big difference between poor whites and slaves is obviously the freedom. But when you look at like their quality of life, it's very similar, and that shocks a lot of people because you don't hear about that. Um, they're usually going to be squatters, meaning that they're just living someplace. Um, so, this is generally speaking how the uh, relations in the South go. Let's skip this video because it's not going to work. All right. Um, even though that the planters are going to make up the smallest percentage of the population, they absolutely control Southern society. Um, you know, the small slaveholders, they want to become planters. The farmers are going to do business with the planters. The poor whites are going to be the ones who are working for the planters. So it's really these planters, even though they're only 5% of the population, they do control society. Everybody kind of defers to them. The goal of white society in the South before the Civil War is to maintain control over African Americans. Uh, that is the primary reason of slavery, is to keep that division of labor and that division of... Um, oh, I don't even know how I want to put that. Uh, racial division. To keep that racial division rigid. No matter if you were a poor white or the richest planter, African Americans were seen as being inferior. And if it was acknowledged that the poor whites and the, the slaves were living a similar lifestyle, then that would mean that everybody was equal. And that's something that you could not do in Southern society. That was a foreign concept to them. So even the poorest of the poor white person elevated themselves above that of the slave. And what's even crazy to me is there, there were pro-slavery arguments. Um, there were religious arguments. Slavery was in the Bible. There was historical arguments. Slavery was okay in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. 
Uh, there were arguments that said that slavery civilized the African Americans and taught them how to live. And then, possibly the craziest one, slaves are treated better than the workers in the North. Now, I know you read about the the Lowell Mill girls and them working from like the age of five to 25. Um, slave owners would say that their slaves were treated better than those people, never mind the fact that the people up North had freedom and could move about and do whatever they wanted. So that, that argument doesn't exactly hold water, especially today now that we know better. Um, so slavery, there were pro-slavery arguments, a lot of anti-slavery arguments, but there were some pro-slavery arguments out there. Now, what about slave society? Uh, the first thing I, I have to tell you is that this is really difficult to summarize because there are so many things that are different, so many variables. Um, some of the things that could change how you were treated if you were a slave <clears throat> if you lived along the coast, if you lived in the deep south, if you lived in urban areas or rural areas, because because urban slaves were very often treated better than rural slaves. Also, if you were a house worker or a field worker, all of these things are going to change the way your life is. So I'm going to do my absolute best to be general, but just know that there's a lot of differences and I highly recommend that you explore this more. All right, material provisions. The first thing, uh, food. It's extremely basic. You're looking at cornmeal, coffee, molasses or corn syrup, and some pork because pork was the cheapest meat. Most of the time, you're going to be allowed to have vegetables that you grow from your own garden, but you can't do any work in your garden until your chores are done. Uh, some of the very, very lucky slaves are trusted to hunt, but those are few and far between. Uh, clothing, it's going to be burlap, those really rough sacks that like potatoes come in. Uh, that's what your pants are going to be made out of if you're a male. Uh, women are going to get a cotton dress or two. Uh, men will get a cotton shirt or two. And that's per year. And if your cotton shirt breaks and tears up and gets holes, you have to mend it. And if your cotton shirt becomes unusable, you don't get another one. If you work in a field, usually you'll be given a straw hat. That's not because they were worried about your health, it's so that you didn't pass out in the sun and you could keep working. And then finally, you only get shoes when it gets cold. And the person who decides when it's cold is the person who's buying the shoes. So they're going to wait until the absolute last minute to get those shoes for you. Uh, housing, uh, imagine a cabin the size of an average bedroom today. Uh, there's going to be a wooden door. There's going to be a couple of windows. There's no glass, only wooden shutters. So the wind comes howling through and it's not very, uh, very warm in the cold. The floors are going to be made of mud. There is going to be mud in your walls to try and block the cracks. And there's going to be a chimney because there's a fire to keep you warm. You're probably going to sleep on the floor, much like a cow or a horse. There will be straw on the floor for you to sleep in and this bedroom that you're sleeping in or you know this cabin that's the size of a bedroom there's lots of times more than one family in there too so it's very cramped and crowded there's a lot of disease between the poor diets and the high population density uh, there are a lot of illnesses going around and doctors are only called in the absolute worst scenarios so diseases are going to be rapid, and if a disease hits a plantation, the entire plantation could go down for days. Uh, there's often going to be somebody in the slave population who is familiar with um, natural remedies, and the sick slaves are going to go to that person before a doctor is called. There are two types of work patterns. Uh, you've got gang labor and you've got task labor. In task labor, everybody's performing an individual task. Uh, that's what you're going to find in rice paddies and on sugar plantations. Everybody has a job to do and that job is done independently. 
Uh, gang labor is where everybody works in a gang. That's what you're going to find in cotton fields and tobacco fields. So you're going to have men and women out in the field together, but they're going to be doing different jobs at the same time. Like somebody might be taking care of the bugs while somebody else is pulling up the weeds. So gang labor, everybody works together in a gang. Task labor, everybody does an individual task. When do you work? It's basically sun up to sun down. Uh, you work when you're told to work under penalty of whipping or something like that. Uh, the work does vary a little bit from season to season. Obviously spring and early summer are going to be the busiest because that's when you're planting and plowing and weeding and picking. Um, later in the summer, you know, there might be a, a second harvest to do. And then in the winter, you're going to be getting the seeds ready for the next year and repairing any of the equipment. Um, <clears throat> typically, there's a, a week between Christmas and New Year's where you don't do anything, but that's really going to be about the only break you get. There are some slaves that work as servants, and while overall their conditions are a little better because they're not out in the hot sun, there are some ways that they're worse too because they're going to be working really close to the owner. So there can be unwanted sexual advances. Uh, everything they do is going to be scrutinized, and um, the punishments can be more severe. So those working as servants, they have a very different life than those that work out in the field. There are even some slaves that live in cities. Uh, generally speaking, the slaves who live in cities have freedom of movement. They can move around. In places like Savannah and Charleston, the slaves are the ones doing the shopping, doing the business, but they're always expected to come back home. And if they're found someplace they're not supposed to be, they can be punished for it. Uh, some slaves are going to work in factories and in mines, and any wages that are earned are going to go to the master. Uh, skilled slaves like a tinsmith or a coppersmith, something like that, they're going to have high values. There was a story of a slave being sold in Charleston for like $20,000, which is like $3 million today. And Charleston, they kept excellent records of their slave market and their slave auctions. So we have, you know, complete documents and details on how much people spent, how the, the uh, sales process went and everything. Now there are some ways of controlling slaves. Um, and it's not the physical control that's bad, it's the mental control because you know mental anguish and mental pain is always going to last longer than physical pain. Uh, the slaves are going to be whipped, caged, branded, um, and it's all legal. In 1830 there is a Supreme Court case in North Carolina. So this is the North Carolina Supreme Court in their state called North Carolina versus man. And in North Carolina versus man, it's ruled that slave owners can do anything they want to their slaves. They have absolute authority. And once North Carolina comes up with that, other Southern states do the same thing. And very famously, the chief justice of North Carolina, Thomas Ruffin says, the power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. A slave owner in North Carolina can do anything up to and including murder of their slaves, no penalty under the law. So it says mental control, the idea that the slave can have anything done to them that the owner desires without penalty. That is the real control. Slaves, every movement they make is controlled. They're always on the run. They're going to be searched. Even when they are they have permission to go and do something, slave patrols can stop them, question them, and pick them up and take them to jail and, and hurt them, murder them, you name it. Um, there's no guarantees about your future. There's no guarantee that your family's going to be kept together. There's no guarantee you're going to be safe. Um, every single time, there's going to be some sort of mental issue or worry going on. Now there were good masters and there were bad masters. And notice on this it has a, in quotations because whether it was a good master or a bad master, they still are going to treat the slave like property. 
Sometimes you treat your property well, like you put your cell phone in a case and you make sure it's protected. Well, these masters would make sure that their that their slaves were well taken care of and well fed and, and you know, disease free. Um, masters are going to be seen as bad because they just treat their slaves like replaceable property. And I know this isn't a world history class, but this is always of interest. Um, if you were a slave in Brazil, your average lifespan is 23 years of age. And that's because a lot of the slave owners in Brazil, they knew that they could replace their slaves easily because of how close it was to Africa. And so they're treated very, very poorly down there. There's going to be resistance. There's individual resistance. Slaves are going to work slower or run away. Uh, there's going to be theft, arson, murder, you name it. Um, Fr uh, Frederick Douglass, I don't know if any of you have ever read his story or not, but he actually ran away more than once. And he, would, he came back every time except for the final one where he finally fled to Maryland. There are three um, large-scale rebellions, though. And really, there's only three. Let me move this little... There we go. All right, so there's Gabriel Prosser's Rebellion. It happens on August 30th of 1800. Uh, there had just recently been a slave revolt on the island of Haiti, and news of that spread to the mainland. And Gabriel Prosser has heard about this rebellion. And he's a blacksmith. He has a little bit of freedom because of his position. Uh, he and his brother are able to go around and talk to other slaves. And uh, he's going to get the support of about 50 to 60 slaves. And they plan to burn down the city of Richmond, Virginia. But it rains when the plan is supposed to take place. The plot is going to be discovered. And all the leaders are going to be executed. In 1822, there's a man named Denmark Vesey. Uh, he's living in Charleston, South Carolina, and he has won his freedom in a lottery. Um, yeah, uh, he won his freedom in a lottery. That's, that's what happened. Uh, just imagine that. You know, you go to gas station, you play the lottery, and you win your freedom instead of a free ticket. That's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, because he was technically a free black, he could move around Charleston with a fair amount of freedom. And he was going to plan a rebellion amongst some of the leading family slaves throughout the city. So he goes to these houses and he talks to these slaves and, you know, he gets a pretty good group of people. Uh, we think somewhere around 3,000 total people were involved in this. And uh, when the rebellion is found... Leaders are going to be executed there, too. Now, the absolute best-known rebellion is Nat Turner's Rebellion. It's August of 1831. Uh, Turner is educated as a child, and he becomes a preacher. And he has these visions from God that he is supposed to free his people. And he plans for a long time on how to revolt. Uh, by the time his rebellion begins, he's got about 100 slaves that he's leading. Uh, he tries to get more to join, but a lot of them were scared. And uh, they are going to kill 60 men, women, and children of, um, of uh, Virginia, young and old, it doesn't matter. Um, when the rebellion is finally put down two days later, uh, 200 African Americans are going to be executed, including many who knew th of the rebellion, but they didn't actually join in. Uh, they were killed also for um, being accessories. And for many people, because Nat Turner was well-educated, he had freedom, he was a man of God, and he was able to get a pretty big group of people together, this is going to scare white Southerners for years to come. And it, more than anything else, it's Nat Turner's rebellion that is going to stop the idea of educating slaves before the Civil War. All right, that is it for this lecture. I will put together another lecture for the uh, Manifest Destiny and I will post that here in a little bit. But thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And let me know if you have any comments or if you see any improvements that need to be made. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon.